Um, wanted to start by showing my t-shirt. It says Socialism and Slavery. And uh, earlier today I was in a grocery store and a lady walked past me and she saw my t-shirt. She smiled from ear to ear and she said, you got that right, pointing at my t-shirt. Um, I mean, how likely are you to have that kind of episode pretty much in any other country? It just goes to show that, I, I think it goes to show that uh, with all its flaws, American society in terms of its ideology, and there is no single ideology for American society obviously, but the, the proliferation of at least some correct ideas, uh, you know, ideas that you know, I sympathize with and a lot of my subscribers do, I think it's, it's something pretty darn unique. Um, Anyway, what I want to talk about today is, and if I have time, I'm going to record two videos tonight. If not, I'm going to continue tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to address the, uh, the arguments, the position that stateless society is impossible, um, that I encounter a lot, uh, you know, when I post on Facebook and in private conversations that I have with people. Um, I hear that a lot. The stateless society is impossible. Yeah, you know, you, what you're saying sort of makes sense, but it's never never going to happen. It's impossible. So I'm going to explore two major objections, or rather two major reasons why those people, or the, you know, the reasons that those people state uh, to back up their belief that uh, stateless society is impossible. And the two positions are, one, stateless society will not be inher inherently stable internally stable, um, so it's not going to work internally. Uh, not just that it's gonna, not going to be stable, uh, the position is sort, of, is sort of twofold. One is that it's going to be horrible, it's going to work very, very badly from the standpoint of how society is going to be organized in absence of a centralized authority. And two, that it will necessarily, and I repeat, necessarily devolve or evolve, depending on who you ask, uh, into a state. It's not going to remain stateless. It is uh, the conditions in a stateless society will be such that a, a state will necessarily emerge. So I'm going to uh, in in this first video. I'm going to devote time to, um, I think, debunking both those notions. A that stateless society is going to be horrible and it's going to work very badly for people who live in it, worse than a state. And two, that any stateless society will necessarily have to devolve into a state because it's inherently unstable. Um, and in the second part, which I don't know, again, if I'm going to be recording tonight or tomorrow, I'm going to address the, the mother of all objections, the external threat slash defense argument. Now, I'm going to be stealing heavily from a lot of my, from some of my subscribers, um, but uh, because, you know, a, a lot smarter people than myself have thought about these things and spoken about these things at length, um, but I don't feel badly about stealing their content because I think these things bear repeating. In fact, they, they need to be repeated uh, as much as possible. So let's start with uh, stateless society or anarchy being inherently you know, unworkable, internally unworkable. One, the argument that I'm going to deal with is, you know, again, the position I'm going to deal with is uh, uh, that uh, stateless, society, stateless society is actually going to work very badly um, from the standpoint of the legal order. Like, how do you live your life if there is no centralized arbiter, um, if, if there is no final authority that can put an end to a dispute? Really what we need to be thinking about is dispute resolution. Why? Because if there's no dispute, there's no problem. If we are in agreement, we're carrying out our activities, you know, in our daily lives, we're doing commerce, we work, we trade, whatever. If, if there is no disagreement, if there is no dispute, then there is no problem, state or no state. Right? Well, obviously with state you do have a problem because state keeps interfering in peaceful activities of, of people, individuals and groups, but uh, uh, the really important aspect is how does the system that you live under help you deal with conflict? Um, I think everybody will agree that conflict resolution is important to having a productive and peaceful society. I mean, you know, 
fighting all the time, devoting uh, much or all of your energy to just fighting will lead to living very poor lives, you know, if you don't have any, if, if, you, if, if a lot of your time is consumed by fighting and, uh, you know, repelling aggression or aggressing against others, then you just, you simply don't have time to produce things that you want to consume to make your life better. Um, so, as long as we agree that everybody's goal is to have as peaceful a coexistence among people as possible, that is the context in which we're looking at dispute resolution, conflict resolution. So the position we need to address is that a state provides a better environment for dispute resolution. Now, I'm not going to make a very long explanation or give you a very long explanation or, or exposition on why I think this is an erroneous position, erroneous view. I will refer you, and I will link to the, in the description, to a wonderful lecture by Roderick Long. Um, it's part of an uh, equally wonderful series of lectures, 10 lectures if I'm not mistaken, on the foundations of libertarian ethics. I love Long. I think I, I love his style. I love his you know style of argument, his, you know style of presentation. Uh, he's got a lot of very very interesting ideas. I think he's a he's an interesting philosopher. If you're interested in the libertarian philosophy, you need to look into Long. You know, read his writings and uh, you know find his lectures on YouTube and iTunes University, and just consume as much of that as possible. It, it's all great content. I do not remember. A bad lecture by Roderick Long, and I've listened to several dozen, I think. Um, so I'll refer to that lecture, but I'll repeat a few points, a couple of points at least. Um, you know, common objections or or, or uh, misapprehensions that people have about anarchistic legal order. You know, and people are thinking that well, you know, it's going to be worse than a status legal order for various reasons. One of the reasons that is commonly given is that. Um, Oh, and before I go into the specific arguments, I think what we need to demonstrate in order to put to rest this argument about whether uh, um, you know, stateless society is preferable and or possible, I think we just need to, in terms of it being possible and you know inherently stable, not devolving into a state, since the argument is it will always do so, we simply need to point out examples of when it didn't. Okay, we need to point out examples of stable, polycentric law societies, and they exist. They have existed, and uh, in fact, they they exist even today in layers and strata. Even in today's status societies, polycentric legal order exists. It is stable, and I think as long as we're able to demonstrate. Uh, give examples of such of such uh, polycentric orders. I think that puts to rest the argument that such such a thing is impossible and you know not durable, uh, not sustainable. As far as the the uh, whether or not a status legal order is better than anarchy, again we need to point out. We not only do we need to demonstrate that a stateless legal order is actually, you know, uh, can, can work quite nicely and, and uh, quite conveniently for people, we also need to point out the problems with the status legal order. Like, so, so the argument is, anarchy is not worse, or rather, is not necessarily worse than the state. In my opinion, it's better all around, um, but I think we, we need at least to put forth a, you know, we, we don't have to put the, the strongest case, like it's always going to be better. Uh, we need to prove that, at least in some points, there's a problem with the status legal order. Uh, and an anarchy, an, an anarchistic society, polycentric law society, or private law society, in, in uh, Hans Hermann Hobby's terminology, um, would actually be better equipped to deal with conflict resolution, which is its you know whole function. Um, so it doesn't have to be a definitive... Uh, strong argument, and you know, although I, I do think it turns out to be pretty strong, we need to point out that state is problematic and uh, point out at least several areas where a stateless legal order is less problematic and better equipped to provide better, more smooth conflict resolution. As long as we're able to do that, I think that part of the argument is done with. Um, so let's delve into uh, you know, a couple of a couple of issues that people have with uh, 
you know, anarchy, anarchy uh, as a legal order. One is there is no final arbiter. That's exactly the point that people are making. Well, how are you going to res resolve your disputes if there is no final arbiter for your conflict? The idea is that under state, you have several levels of jurisdictions, uh, ending with the Supreme Court in the case of the United States, whose decision is final. So you need to have someone, some arbiter, who will have the final say in any matter. Because absent that, what you have is constant, endless appeals. If you're going to appeal laterally to a different court, say uh, under anarchy, you know, two parties decide that they're going to go to arbitrator A. And then, you know, arbit uh, arbitrator A renders a decision. One of the parties is not happy with the decision. They, you know, they appeal to arbitrator B. Uh, well, the other party or the same party may not be happy with that arbitrator's decision either. And they, they, in principle, they have the freedom to continue to appeal laterally to other courts and other arbitration companies, um, which is true. Uh, there is no conceivable final arbiter in a private law society. Uh, people go to arbitration based on their mutual consent when two parties have a conflict or a dispute. Um, and there is nothing you know, that, that, that says that uh, a certain arbiter is going to be final. Now, you, you, I, I, you know, I suppose you, you may have contracts where you know, both parties agree that they will only appeal X number of times. But in principle, yeah, you could have an endless appeal kind of loop. Uh, okay, fine. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Again, in principle, it's sort of plausible. On the other hand, under, under the state, it is said, you have the Supreme Court of the land, and you know their decision is final. Well, uh, Roderick Long, I think, gives a brilliant explanation of this legal finality. Finality? Legal finality. And he says that we need to, to, to speak about legal finality in at least two senses. One sense is this platonic sense of, you know, I ideal sense of, total and ideal finality, where it's inconceivable, it's impossible to further appeal to anybody because there is nobody else to appeal, uh, and, and it, um, once that arbiter renders a decision, that's it. That's it. There's no further action that is possible. Possible even in principle. And the other is the practical sense in which we talk about legal finality where it is not practical, 99.9% .9 of people in this position to, you know, legislate, uh, to, to, to litigate, will not appeal past a certain point. Those are two distinct senses. They're very different. And in fact, it is actually possible to show that even under the state, there is no platonic legal finality. Because, uh, well, let's say, for example, you, your, your case makes it to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court decides against you. Does that mean that that's it? There's nothing else you can do. It does not. It does not. You do have other things that you can you can do, depending on you know you know whether you're inclined to do them or equipped to do them. You could uh, get a president elected who would uh, nominate somebody else to the Supreme Court, and that new court would overturn the previous decision of the Supreme Court. Uh, you could do that. Uh, you could uh, you know appeal to Congress and have a law passed that will effectively nullify that decision or reverse that decision. That can be done as well. Or you can foment a revolution and, and just take over. All those things are theoretically possible. So in the platonic sense, there is no legal finality even after the Supreme Court has rendered a decision. The question is, what are most people likely to do? How far are most people likely to go? In reality, most people are not likely to even make it to the Supreme Court.
in reality, most people, most people will, will give up way before that. Only so many cases make it to the Supreme Court. I'm sure that wherever, you know, whatever the other level of jurisdiction, you know, court level that, you know, all the other cases, you know, uh, are decided for the last time, you know, beyond, you know, to the point beyond which there is no appeal in practice, a lot of people are unhappy with those decisions. They simply choose not to take it further. Maybe they don't have the resources, they don't have the money to hire the lawyers to take to the Supreme Court. I don't know. Maybe they just lost interest. Maybe it just it's kind of productive to them to pursue the matter further. It doesn't matter why. But a lot of people choose not to continue to appeal, even under the status system where they have the opportunity to. So in the platonic sense, the legal finality doesn't exist even under the state. And in the practical sense... Uh, the finality is determined by lots and lots of factors, and a lot of those factors, you know, kick into play. So you know, kick in uh, way before you reach the you know the status platonic concept of the Supreme Court. People choose not to pursue the matter any further based on you know any number of considerations that they might have. So in that sense, uh, there is no real. You know, definitive advantage to the status system over an anarchistic legal order or polycentric law in terms of legal finality. Another common objection to an anarchistic legal order is that there is no one settled body of law because there is no one legislator. Um, now, the judicial, or rather, the uh, the conflict resolution as a complex service sort of has uh, several aspects to it. One is the legislative aspect, like who makes the laws, who makes the rules by which cases are decided or conflicts are, uh, disputes are resolved and even tried or heard. Um, the other is the, ju ju the judicial, who hears the cases, who tries the case, who hears the cases, right? And who decides the cases? Who, who are the judges? And the third is executive. How do you enforce those decisions? Um, so, um, the from the legislative perspective, yes, the, the objection is that in, in under anarchy, you don't have one commonly known, clear, and known to everyone body of law. Um, because there is no one central legislator who makes laws. In fact, there are no lawmakers in anarchy, under anarchy, there are law takers because judges emerge on the market as skillful arbiters whose specialty is helping people resolve their disputes. Um, they do not make law, they take law. The law emerges from millions and billions of interactions, customs, traditions, decisions made by real people in real circumstances. It was commonly referred to as common law. Um, and that's how law uh, evolved for a very, very long time, say, in England. Uh, up until fairly recently, by historical uh, scale, um, law in England was not a monopoly of the crown. I will link to a book um, on the matter that I'm planning to buy. It's on my wish list on Amazon. Uh, that was recommended by somebody in some lecture that I was listening to recently. I don't remember where I heard it, but uh, I'm definitely buying it. I'm reading it. Uh, common law was a local thing, and judges were not appointed by the crown, and the, the function of dispute resolution was not usurped by the crown until relatively recently, just a few centuries ago, in England. So, so okay, let's deal with that objection. Yes, there is no common, uh, I mean, there is no central one centralized, commonly known to everybody, body of law, a book that says everything there is to know about what's right and what's wrong, what's uh, permissible and what's not. Well, under anarchy, that's true. But under the state, I would argue that there is no, functionally, there is no one settled, commonly known body of law for a different reason, though. Um, there is a central legislator, but they overproduce laws. I can't cite you the number of laws and the number of pages of laws that U.S. Congress puts out every year, but suffice it to say that if anybody 
decided to learn all the U.S. law, what is it called, the U.S. Federal Code, all of the laws that are on the book that theoretically we need to observe and follow and that need to be enforced. There is no one person in the world capable of knowing all that because uh, there is not enough. To, there are not enough hours in the week and in the month and in the year to read, let alone understand and memorize all of the laws that Congress makes every single damn year. That is a functional equivalent of there being no one settled body of law under a state. I don't see how anarchy would be any worse than that. In fact, Ayn Rand um, perceptively, perceptively argued, and I had come to the same conclusion way before, although I, I thought my conclusion only referred to Russia, present-day Russia, not Soviet Union, but I think it refers to, uh, it applies to every state, definitely applies to the United States, is that this is by design. All of these laws that exist on the book, they do not exist in order to be uh, rigorously enforced every single day uh, as applied to everyone. No, they exist in order to just be there as a tool. And if the state decides to act against an individual or a group, there's always some law that this group or individual are breaking. And this, this enormous, enormous code enormous web of obscure, unknown, unknowable legislation exists as a potential bludgeon to go after, the, for, for the state to be able to go after anybody they damn please. That's certainly true for Russia today. That's certainly true for the U.S. Uh, again, that, that, that's my conviction. I, 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 think, I think at least some people in the legislative branch uh, are aware of that fact and see it exactly that way. That it's a, it's a very useful tool. All this multiplicity of law is a very useful tool to oppress. So from that perspective, I don't see how anarchistic polycentric law is any worse than the state. Um, and there's all sorts of other objections, but again, I refer you to Roderick Long's lecture. I think it's brilliant, and he, he does a much better job than myself. Uh, in explaining why these objections are not valid, and you would, you would, I think you would benefit greatly if you watch that video, as well as all, you know, the, the other nine in the series. So um, that you know, my my reading of this is, I, you know, at least to my satisfaction, I think I, I've been shown uh, by all the you know evidence that I studied that. An anarchistic legal order is actually, in, in fact, not going to be worse than the state. Uh, on the other hand, it actually it, it gives you one important advantage. Uh, I think it's a correct position that it, it, you know it, it would be bad for uh, to have a situation where somebody is in judge is a judge in their own case. Um, and the fallacy, the statist fallacy, uh, with regards to a legal system or legal order, goes like this. Nobody should be a judge in their own case. Therefore, so a, a third-party arbiter, an independent arbiter, should be a judge in everybody's case, should a, a need for a case to be heard arise at all. Therefore, there needs to be one agency that's a judge in everybody's case. Well, that's, that's a fallacy. As Roger Longfield said, you know, anybody who likes at least one TV show doesn't mean, it doesn't follow from that, that, the, the, that there's at least one TV show that everybody likes. Um, Yes, there needs to be, for any dispute between two parties, they need, there need to be a third party. If one of the two parties is a judge in the case, that's not ideal, obviously. Um, but from that, it doesn't follow from that that um, there needs to be one agency that acts as a central judge in every single dispute. Because, precisely because of the formulation of the problem in the first place, because what about uh, a conflict that you have with that agency? What about the problem that you have with the king, or with, uh, with the Congress, or with, with, with the president? They act as a judge in their own case, in, in, you know, in that situation. And again, uh, uh, to quote Roderick Long, like, you know, people may say to that, well, you know, you may have a, a conflict with uh, the uh, executive branch, for example, but don't worry, because the judicial branch, the, ju the ju judicial branch of the U.S. federal government as in, you know, the Supreme Court, is a different branch. Well, it's a different branch, true, but, you know, would you be comforted, if, if you had a conflict with, say, the marketing department of Walmart, 
would you be comforted by you know somebody who would say, "Don't worry, the the uh, the dispute is going to be resolved by the legal department of Walmart." I, I don't think it. You know, I don't think so. It doesn't sound very comforting to me. So, the the main object this main this objection against the anarchistic legal order is in fact uh, the strongest in my mind. One of the strongest objections against the status legal order. Uh, the state is above the law, and if you, if you think about it a little further, you will understand that the state necessarily needs to be above the law. The state, uh, the state, which is supposed to enforce the laws on every one of us, will necessarily have to break those laws. It will have to place itself outside the sphere of enforcement of the, of the laws that it purports to, you know, legislate and enforce on everybody else, every one of us. For example, the state tells us not to steal, and yet the state is the agency that, by definition, exists uh, by taxing people by taking their property without their consent, which is stealing. So, you know, the enforcer of thou shall not steal cannot exist unless it has unless it has the opportunity to steal. You ban it, you know, I mean, you, you forbid it to steal, it ceases to exist. Okay? So, yeah, so I, I don't want to go too much further into that. Again, you know, please go to the wonderful lecture by, by Roderick Long. I want to deal with the second part of the argument, which says that, you know, um, anarchy is not going to work because any stateless society will re resort or revert to a state simply because of the logic of how things progress in society. Somebody will take over, you know, some warlord will take over and they will just, you know, through the force of arms, you know, the application of sheer physical force and violence, just subjugate everybody and that'll end up being a state. Well, all we need to show again is that this is not necessarily so. Because the argument is it always has to be so. I think once we show that it's not necessarily so, that argument goes away. You know, not always. If, if, we, if we have at least one instance where it doesn't happen, then the always part of the argument goes away, whether it goes the whole composition. So, and that, you know, brings us to like medieval Ireland and also Iceland. Ireland is, you know, more interesting because it existed for like a thousand years, and they had polycentric legal system, free on law, and it didn't devolve into any kind of state. Although, you know, they were, and this sort of segues into my next video, they were under constant um, attacks by would-be invaders and conquerors. All of them states, by the way, who were trying to come in set up and impose their order on that territory and on that population and they failed time and time again. It, it took the the British almost 500 years to conquer Ireland which was only like 20 miles away from them and it was you know the population of Ireland was not too huge but this again I'm, I'm sort of borrowing from my next video. Um, again polycentric legal order exists today it has existed in history, and it was very, very stable. Um, it was, it was effective. People actually did get their disputes resolved. It resulted in a very ordered, peaceful, and law-abiding society. Um, the Irish had the reputation of being extremely law-abiding. Extremely law-abiding. I think it's a cultural thing. Once you live under a condition where you have to deal with people by agreement rather than by force of arms, uh, it sort of gets ingrained generation after generation after generation. You have respect. You come to have respect for law, argument, um, ar arbitration, and you abide by these things. Um, I, I will urge you to study more about medieval Ireland and about Brion law how that was a true polycentric legal order. It wasn't ideal from my personal perspective. I wouldn't want to necessarily live under it, although I'm not sure. Maybe, you know, I, I think I might, have, I might prefer that system to whatever we have today. I haven't really thought about it in, in that way, but uh, it was stable and it existed for many, many centuries and it showed no signs of disintegrating. And it did disintegrate finally, but that wasn't because of its inher inherent instability or contradictions. Um, Brions emerged on the market as wise people able to uh, sort of reason their way through a dispute and come to an agreeable resolution. Um, 
so much that people actually would come to them and ask for their service. And that shows you that it is conceivable that people will organize themselves in such a way as to not need a centralized dispute resolution authority. You can have a stable, polycentric legal order where dispute resolution is handled on the market. Um, same goes for Iceland. Um, in Iceland, uh, the saying goes, uh, the Icelandic people, they didn't have, they had no king but the law. They really didn't have any kings, but they had the law. And the law was polycentric. There was no central legislator. There was there was the Althing, but which was nothing like the parliaments of today, where different you know judges, you know, what would be called Brian in, in in Ireland. I forget what they were called in uh, in Iceland, if there even was a term. Um, they were not lawmakers, but they were law takers, and they uh, interpreted situations based on in their wisdom, on their knowledge of how you know, similar cases were dealt with previously, and common law emerged, guided by those wise people whose services were called for on the market by the demand of consumers. Consumers being people who needed disputes resolved. Um, so, um, I know this is very brief and not very detailed, but I think at least this gives you an indication of how to deal with these arguments. Again, one, I think we can demonstrate um, that an anarchist legal order would not necessarily be very bad. In fact, it would be better than a status legal order in several very important aspects. Um, and two, that uh, a polycentric legal system is not inherently unstable. It's not necessarily does not necessarily have to devolve into a state. I understand that um, the question of whether or not an anarchist society would devolve into a state goes beyond just the legal system. It, it also has to do with, well, it kind of, no, it kind of doesn't really, you know, because what's also important uh, about those societies, those stateless societies, that there was no taxation. Nobody could just tax people, just come to people and say, you give me money or else. I mean, they could try, but it wouldn't, and it didn't work. Um, that means that whatever, you know, a king in Ireland, and the king in Ireland was nothing like the kings that we typically think of when we hear the word, um, they could not amass uh, large resources and raise armies to go and conquer people. And if they needed uh, services of armed men, they had to pay them. And since they couldn't raise taxes, um, the, their ability to inflict harm through violence was very, very limited. And those societies, again, they were not inherently unstable. They, you know, both of them collapsed eventually for a you know, multitude of reasons. But those reasons, if you really look into those two countries, they were not, uh, it, at least it's not definitive, it's not obvious at all that uh, this devolution, uh, this, you know, reverting to a state or ending up as a state uh, was completely predetermined by the you know sheer nature of a stateless society okay I know this is kind of confusing and not very clear but at least maybe this gives you an indication of where to look and sort of in a direction in which to think and research more in my next video I'm going to deal with um, external threats whether any stateless society will necessarily have to succumb to external invasion and aggression by you know conquering states um, again, uh, I'm going to be borrowing from, from some very smart people here on YouTube, and specifically I want to uh, uh, do a shout out to Lengthy and Arthur. Uh, he's, he's one of my subscribers, and I'm his, I'm his subscriber. He's uh, taught me a great deal. Uh, he's a very clear thinker, and he's, he's very, very educated and very, very well read. Um, and if you're interested in the problems of you know, libertarian defense, for example, there's probably no better source on YouTube that I can think of maybe fringe elements uh he has a slightly different perspective or rather substantially different perspective yeah but he's still he's an anti-status as well uh but like the Arthur is easily one of the better sources one of the most informative sources uh, uh of information and research and 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 thought on these issues so go to his channel check him out he's got you know, lots of long videos all of them are absolutely worth your time if if uh these kind of topics interest you at all. So, see you in my next video.